Take your Bibles, please. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. This series that we are starting today, I can honestly say I have been so very hungry to preach. It's one of those, it's been a joy to just study. And God has spoken in my heart. I pray that he speaks to yours. Uh, we've already talked about it today. There's just so much in the news that I don't like. Uh, and again, like I talked to the Sunday school class, I'm not advocating anything, but we don't even have an antenna on our television. I'll check, I'll check a couple of websites and then I'm done getting the news. I'm just, you know, it's just so sad what's going on in our country. Sin is wreaking havoc, isn't it? And I just, I just had a passion. I wanted to just be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So I'm starting a series. I'm not even going to get done with the introduction to the series this morning. That's okay. We're not going to try and rip through it. We're just going to be looking to him. I'm so glad for that. Took time in the Sunday school class this morning. Wanted to speak about heaven. I'll be finishing it up this next week here in the auditorium class. So glad we're got, we've got heaven waiting for us. Not a one of us, doesn't matter what our age is, not a one of us, if we're saved, we're going to be there. I praise God for that. So let's just take the time. We're going to pray and we're going to ask God to open our hearts, open our eyes. We're going to rejoice in who He is. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Savior, may they come to know you. And Lord, if there's anyone here, their heart has grown cold about your presence, about your promises, about your will, whatever it might be, touch hearts, I ask. In Christ's name, amen. I want to go to an excerpt, part of which I wrote a couple of weeks ago, when we were finishing up another series, I want to remind us of something. This is about Christ. He never owns a home. He never writes a book. He never holds an office. He never has a family. He never goes to college. He never puts his foot inside a big city. He never travels 200 miles from the place he was born. He never does anything that usually accompanies greatness in the eyes of man. He has no credentials but himself, no endorsement but from his Father in heaven. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion goes very much for him and then turns against him. At a very critical hour, his friends run away. One of them denies him, another betrays him. He is turned over to his enemies. He goes through the mockery of a trial. He is nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he is dying, his executioners gamble for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. He had gone about doing nothing but good. He spoke like no other man had ever spoken. He healed and fed even those that never thanked him. He taught multitudes, including those that refused to hear him. He prayed over the city that would first welcome him, then call for his crucifixion. He healed one who helped arrest him. He forgave those that taunted 
and tortured and mocked him as he hung on a cross. He died paying for their sin while still hearing the voices of those who hated him. And then he arose. In that he completed the work of his Father who sent him. I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're sitting with the Apostle Paul. He is writing the last letter that would become part of the canon of the New Testament. It was a letter that he was writing to a young man named Timothy. It was his second letter that is in the canon that he wrote to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we will begin with Paul in verse 6. Wherefore, he says, I put thee in remembrance, Timothy, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Let that sink in, please. God purposes, and he will do his purposes. Amen? By his grace. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to the light, excuse me, to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Here's the verse I wanted us to get to. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know, K-N-O-W, for I know whom I have believed. And it goes farther than that, Timothy. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against what? That day. You see, Paul is going to heaven too. He's going to stand. His works will be judged at the Bema Seat of Christ. But Paul is looking forward to that time when he is going to be with Christ. In fact, as we saw in the book of Philippians this last week, he wanted to be in heaven. But he said, it's needful that I'm here. I, I, I need to be with you, church at Philippi. But oh, how I want to be in glory. Meanwhile, while he is here, he wants to know Christ. He wants to live Him. He wants to serve Him. His whole life is about Christ. Paul has given up so much. His family was wealthy. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers there in that time in Israel sat there at the feet of Gamaliel, learned much. He was so given to the Jewish religion. And then he met Christ. And from that time to the time that they cut his head off, it was, I am persuaded in this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Listen, Paul lived like that even in the chaos of the Roman Empire, even has, as the Jews were not having the best of lives in the Roman Empire, even seeing people that were misused and abused. Remember this, over half the people in the Roman Empire at this time were slaves in the middle of all that, Paul the Apostle said, for to me to live is Christ. He had one singular focus. You know, we need, we need to set aside some things at times. We need to remember why we're here. We're not here so that we can vote one way or another, although it's important the way we vote. We're not here to make noise with other people who, it seems, they have absolutely given their lives to make noise, although there are times to speak up. We are here because, like Paul, it's needful to be. Otherwise, there's coming the time, like we were talking about in Sunday school, when we'll be with Him, we'll be in glory. But meanwhile, we ought not be ashamed. And our lives ought to be like this. We know who we have believed. This has been a fascinating, absolute fascinating study. Every time when I get in onto Evernote to have my devotions, if I choose to use it, which is most of the time, I open up, I, I've, I've got my iPad or, or my, my computer, and I go in and I'm again my devotions there, and I've got my prayer list and such. The first verse I see is out of Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. When the angels and the throngs in heaven are gathered around the throne, and you hear this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, there's going to be a whole lot that we're going to be looking at when it comes to Jesus Christ in this series. But can we just stop and consider this right now? You sit here, I stand here, we are here for one reason, Him. We are not here because of a cosmic boo-boo. We're not here because of an explosion. We are here because He spoke and it was done. We are in this place because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That son, as we will see, not today, I can't get to all of it. That son that was so prophesied that in two weeks, when you hear so many of the prophecies, and I will not have even begun to scratch the surface on all that was said about Christ in the Old Testament and how he fulfilled prophecy. It's amazing. But we're here because God so loved the world. And we're here because one day we trusted Christ. I'm here because on January 14th, 1967, Saturday night at 8.30 p.m. in my youth pastor's garage over his lawnmower, I trusted Christ as Savior. I can take you to the place. And I don't know where your spot is. Maybe you don't remember exactly when and where it was, but you know there was a time you recognized you had a need. You can't work your way to heaven. It doesn't matter where you were born and who you were. You cannot atone for your own sin. And we're all sinners. All of us. But praise God, he who was prophesied, 
He who came, he who died and rose again for us, he's the one that paid the penalty for that sin. Go to Revelation chapter 19, would you please? Revelation chapter 19. I, I love, I love doing this. Somebody says, can, can you, can you, are you a fortune teller? Can you tell the future? No, I can't. But my God knows what's going to happen. Amen. You know what's great? What we are about to read is going to take place in the future. But it is as sure as if it already took place and we are hearing somebody in fact, John is reporting on it like he saw it in time past, but it hasn't happened yet. He was brought to the future by God to take note of these things, to write, to record. Look at verse 11, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, listen to this, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. You know something? Th this, this is what we do. You see, we sit on that. Yep. We, have a, we have a Selah moment. We, we stop and we recognize this. Here we are in Sacramento. But one day, we're with the King of Kings. Right now, we're sitting here. One day, we're going to be sitting on horses with him. And he is going to say, let's go. This whole scenario comes about not again, not because we will it, but because there is a Savior who is Lord. And one day he will come back to this place and he is going to rule and reign until he makes a new heaven and a new earth. As much as we will see prophecy in the Old Testament that comes to pass in exact detail with Christ in his first coming, we have detail that is just as sure regarding his second coming. And he is coming. No matter what the chaos we see, don't you love that? There are people now that are scheming. They want control. They don't want citizens, they want subjects. And you know, for a while, there's going to be some victory there. They think that's what they're going to have. The wicked one is going to come and he will rule through a human. And I mean, he's going to think that he maybe, just maybe has that victory. And then he's going to realize he couldn't be more of a loser. Right. Amen. And Christ is coming. And he's coming. We don't know when, but he's coming to reign. Amen. Amen. Never forget that. Here we were in Israel on the Temple Mount and we're looking at the East Gate. In fact, we're right there, the actual East Gate. 
because of how things have built up. The actual east gate is about 20 feet lower than what we're seeing. But that's the gate Christ is coming through. They closed that up. Hadn't been anybody gone through that since it was closed way back, right after Christ's time. It's going to happen someday. Amen. But meanwhile, here's the question. Like Paul, who says, you know, I know whom I have believed, we can say the same thing too. But like Paul told the church there at Philippi, I, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still growing. We are as well. And I thought, you know, in the time of all this chaos, I thought this is one thing that we can do right now. There are subjects that we can look at in Scripture. But let's just look at Him. Let's just see Him. Recognize He's coming. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 4, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, praise God, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then Paul said, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's something that we can remind each other of. No matter how bad things get, he's coming again. No matter how difficult, he's coming again. And he's with us right now. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. He's here. Amen. But there's coming a time when he's going to come and rule. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Are you glad the Lord's coming back? Say amen. amen. We comforted each other. That's good stuff. Isn't it interesting that we are to take the time to comfort with these very words? He's coming again. There's a work that I've been using in this series. It was written by Graham Scroge. The, the book, and it's a thick one, it's a great one, entitled The Unfolding Drama of Redemption points out something that is fascinating. In the Old Testament, we see that mankind needed three people. Three people. First of all, he needed a priest. A priest to represent him before God. He needed a prophet to reveal God to him and then a king to rule over all his life. As the Old Testament unfolds, we find that there were three just like that. There was Aaron and his line of the priesthood. Moses as the prophet. David came as the king. And all three pointed to Christ. Everything that these Old Testament men were, Christ came and fulfilled it all. Listen, Christ is priest. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for he for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. It's all around him. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor upon himself, but he that is called God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, that's the Father. Today have I begotten thee. Christ came as our high priest. He's the one that represents us. 
not an earthly priest, not a Catholic priest, and not a Baptist preacher. Jesus Christ himself came. He is our mediator between God and man. Not only does he represent us as priest, but as prophet. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Look, if you would, at verse 15. Moses, speaking, said this in verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of, thy, of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. The Lord said unto me, They have well spoken, they which have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Not only that, but he came as king, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, David writing, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We'll be going back to that verse down the road. Listen, that which the Old Testament promises, that which the Old Testament promises, and the singular focus is the coming king. What the Old Testament promises, promises, the New Testament presents. And that's what we're going to see. Christ is the fulfilling of all that mankind needs. Do you realize there is not a need that you have that he cannot fulfill? That he is the singular focus of not just of the law of the God of heaven, the Father that sent him, but also of mankind that cries out, is in need. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? America is quite a nation. We are the richest on earth, and we are also the most anxious. They pour out medicine for anxiety, all kinds of things in this nation like no other nation on earth. We have so much, and we are so bankrupt. Praise God for the great physician. Praise God for the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Praise God for he who comes with healing in his wings. Praise God for our intercessor. Praise God for our elder brother. That's our king. That's our savior. That is our God. As we will learn when we study, in the Old Testament, Christ is predicted. In the Gospels, he's presented. In the epistles, he is possessed because people are trusting him. And in the Revelation, he is predominant. In the time, I want you to go to this. Go to John 19, if you would, please. John 19. In the time when Christ was on trial, Pilate spoke a phrase. You ever ever just kind of catch something when you're reading in the Bible and it's like, wait a minute, let's let's back up a little bit. What what was just said there? Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We've, so many of us have read. By by the way, and I made the, I I made the, um, the statement in Sunday school. Let me make it right now here. When, when we come to church, bring your Bible. Now, I, I'm all for, I, I praise God for all the programs that we can have on a, on a tablet, on iPad, you know, and such. And I've got all that there. But nothing takes the place 
of this, where you can take down a note, where you can underline, when you can put something there to remind you of how God spoke to you. Bring your Bible. Just want to encourage you on that. That was free. Shall we move on? In John 19, here is Pilate with Christ before the multitude in a city where Christ was at first welcome. They joyed over him, and now they've turned on him. Now look at verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he, Pilate, saith unto the Jews, what? Behold your... Pilate's wife has had a nightmare. You be careful what you do with this man. I have suffered things in a, in, in a dream because of him. You be careful. He's caught. He's caught with a man that he just absolutely cannot understand. There is something about him. Here are people that are crying out for his death. He watches, he watches the leadership. He sees what they're doing. And yet here's a man, th th he's done nothing wrong. And yet they're talking about him as the king. And he's spoken to him about it. And he says, behold your king. Look at verse 15. But they cried out, away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And listen to what they said. The chief priest answered, We have no king but who? There are two statements that the Jewish leadership made, and other people, I'm sure, with them. Two statements that they made on this day that I believe have cursed them since then. Number one is this right here. We have no king but Caesar. And the Jews have struggled ever since to have their own land. Secondly, they said this, His blood be on us and on our children. And his blood has been on them ever since. Now I know there's coming the time they will look on him whom they have pierced and there will be those, the remnant of the Jews, that they will recognize he indeed has been, was their king. But you talk to some Jews now, I, re I remember when we were in Israel, and you talk about Christ and the glaze just goes right over the eyes with so many of them. I praise God for the, for the missionary that we have, Craig Hartman, who just happened to wind up in, a, in, his, in his cubicle in his company that he was now working for, there was a soul-winning Baptist that was sitting right next to him and led him to Christ. And now his whole ministry has been about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Praise God for that. But they have so suffered. But you know something? We've got to be careful too. When it comes to our need, who do we really look more towards? Jesus Christ, or now that we're getting close to this age, Social Security. Listen, Social Security is going bankrupt. Jesus Christ owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The government doesn't know how to deal with their money my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. I find it so sad that there was a congressman from Maryland who made a statement four years ago. He said, people come to government. This is an exact quote. People come to government to feed their souls. No, we don't. No, we don't. We come to Christ. Because He is the bread of life. That's where we feed our souls. 
But you know, there are some, they'll go to the God of entertainment, drugs, immorality, alcohol, sports, pornography, anything to feed, anything to put something in that God-sized hole in their heart that they don't quite recognize yet that only God can fill. You young people, you listen to us. You will never, ever find anything on the internet that will feed you like God does. You'll never find a friend. You'll never find a relationship. You'll never find a job. You'll never find anything that can do what Jesus Christ can and should be allowed to do for you. That's what this is all about. I love this passage. And I'm afraid we're going to end here because I just, I've got too much. We will pick it up next week. But go to Luke 24, would you please? Luke 24. Two men have had their world turned upside down. And a, and a, a stranger joins them. He is withholding who he is from them. They're talking about everything that has happened in Jerusalem. And he inquires of it. And their basic response was this, where in the world have you been? Haven't you heard? And they start talking about how Christ and this and that and he died. And, and now there's rumors about him rising from the dead. And oh my, what in the world is going on? And look at verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe. Let's stop right there. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look in my Bible and I read promises, I read commands, I read things about God, and I sit myself down. You ever do this? Just kind of sit yourself down. You know what? You're so slow of heart to believe sometimes. That's why we need to grow. That's why you need and I need to determine right now, as we look into this book, the Word of God, we need to determine that we are going to learn by God's grace all we can about the God of the Word. The Word that according to John 1 became flesh and dwelt among us. We need to determine that, Lord, I need you to, you know, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Why is it that we wind up being a fool. Why is it that when it comes to no the knowledge of the holy, we wind up seeing it not as something that we ought to do, but it's just something that if we want to, we can do. That I may know him, Paul said. Outside of Christ, humanly speaking, Paul had it all. He says, I've counted it all but dung for the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them a dung, that I may win Christ. Now, you look at this passage and I think, I wonder how many times I've been a fool and slow of heart to believe. But then something happened. Let's continue. Look at verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He talked about all the prophets had spoken. Look at verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What was the result of that time? Look at verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart 
burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. Now, can I, can I show you something? You see this Bible? All right. There it is. There's the Old Testament. That's all Christ had. But that's what he had. What you have in your lap right now, what is sitting there, what is before you right now, what is in this book right now, that is what Christ spoke to them about. Moses, the law and the prophets, and they said, did not our heart burn within us? Can I ask you a question? When's the last time your heart burned within you when you read the Word of God? I mean, we, we can talk about this, we can say, man, I would have loved to have been a fly. There was no wall, they were walking, so let's, you know, I, I'd have loved to have been a bird nearby that just kind of kept flittering along, listening. That would have been incredible. But the fact of the matter is, we've got the Holy Spirit. Do we not? Do we not have prayer? Can we not say, Lord, open to us the Scriptures? Can we not compare Scripture with Scripture? I'm telling you, it's going to be a joy in two weeks when we get back into this and we see the things that the Lord probably talked to them about that was written by Moses and the prophets. That's our king. He's king of kings. And all that we need to know about him is sitting in your lap. All it needs is the power of the Holy Spirit, the opening of the Word to us. And we are right there. And we can see Him as He is. The question is, do we really want to? The question is, do we have the passion that Paul did? Again, let me emphasize, the Apostle Paul had it made he was wealthy, he was educated, his time on earth was taken care of. But when he met Christ, it changed everything. Can I ask you, when you met Christ, what did it do to you? When I met him, what did it do to me? You know, I'm hearing a little baby back there cry. Jeremy, is that yours? I love it. We got 12 of them, 12 grandkids. I'm telling you, younger ones, I've said it before, I'll tell you now. You have kids, it's great. You know, you have kids, you get some insanity in your life, but you know, it's okay. But then you have grandkids, and all of a sudden the claws grow bigger. You will not just tell somebody, don't mess with my grandkids. You will nuke them. <laughs> they will be a grease spot. You'll love it. But you know, and you grandparents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You stop and you pray for them. And you recognize, oh my soul. Here is another little one that needs Jesus needs the knowledge, needs to know Him. We've got plenty to pray about. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you, is it your passion, your desire, like Paul? Hey, I know whom I have believed. And in fact, I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Let's stand for prayer.